Okay, I'd like to thank Al for giving my talk. Uh, I too am going to talk about climate modeling, but I will take a somewhat different take on it. My background is I do have a PhD in climatology, but before that my master's was in astrogeophysics, whatever that is. And I have done climate modeling and climate theory, but at heart I'm a true empiricist. Data does trump theory. As Yogi Berra said, you can observe a lot by just watching. Or, as Dr. Maynard Miller, who was the director of the Juno Ice Field, where I spent many a wonderful summer, and we'd be out looking at ice falls and oh eyes on the glaciers and crevasses and so on, and he would say, look, just don't see, no, sorry, see, don't just look, nature is screaming at you. And nature is screaming at us, and screams at us in the form of data. So you really got to give the, the data top bill. Okay, I'm going to talk about climate models and then come up with my own, well, Ward Moncton says his model is irreducibly, irreducible? Irreducibly simple. Irreducibly simple. However, I will reducibly simplify it. Mine has three parameters in it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I can see if I can get it down to one parameter. <laughs> and again, my approach, I'm not going to approach it as a NASA engineer. Actually, the first course I taught in climate science was at a middle school in Boulder, Colorado. Where else would they teach climate science to middle schoolers except in Boulder, home of the world's largest supercomputer for computing climate models. Matter of fact, it is so big and consumes so much electricity, they had to move it to Cheyenne, Wyoming, where they could get much more affordable coal-fired electricity to run the climate model. <laughs> the irony of it all. Okay, so calculating the Earth's temperature, how much global warming can we expect? So I'm on a Mac here. Good, that's the button. Will the Earth warm one degree, five degrees? Not at all. Will it cool? You know, come up with some sort of projection into the future, say by the year 2100, as to what is the magnitude of this climate change due to anthropogenic greenhouse gases, not just CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, fluorocarbons, the, the whole panoply of them. And as someone greater than me is quoted as saying, what difference does it make? How much it changes? Well, global warming policies such are, as being discussed across the road here today, across the plaza, that something will harm the earth or will save the Earth from, you know, from a man-made disaster, will have negative side effects, which we've heard about earlier this afternoon, which can harm the least among us. So that kind of creates a moral dilemma. Do you harm the poor, harm everybody, in order to save the Earth, or, you know, where is the balance? So there is a moral dilemma, you know, a huge dilemma there as to what balance you strike between the two. However, is there really a dilemma, or is it simply a false dilemma? So, how do you calculate the temperature of the planet? This is my Climate Modeling 101 slide. And actually, Hal already went through this, so he probably saves me about five minutes. <laughs> okay. So the annual amount of energy, and I say annual because the Earth moves away and towards the sun over the course of a year, but you take over an annual average, the amount reaching the atmosphere, top of the atmosphere, is roughly constant. However, it does vary depending on the output of the sun itself. The sun is a variable star. That is one of the great discoveries of the century that the sun is not a totally constant item. Matter of fact, the, you know, after they started measuring it, there is a parameter called the solar constant. That's the intensity of sunlight reaching the top of the atmosphere before it's diminished by things in the atmosphere. Well, about 10 years ago, a paper came out called The Variability of the Solar Constant. Beautiful contradiction in terms. So this number called the solar constant varies for solar cycles of 11 years, varies the sunspots rotating across the surface of the, of the sun, varies over centuries, 
and it really varies from 4.6 billion BC up into 11 billion AD when it becomes a red giant. It varies by factors of 100. Okay, so variations in the sun itself. Also the presence of volcanic haze, which is high enough in the atmosphere and the stratosphere that is considered above the weather and the climate, so it affects the amount of sunlight going into the troposphere, which is what we consider the climate layer of the atmosphere, and then the amount of greenhouse gases, which can recycle some of this sunlight that's trying to radiate back out in space. It absorbs it, sends it back down to the ground in the, in the form of infrared radiation. So when you go out and look up and see the sun and the sun shining down in your face and heating your face up, there is a very similar amount of energy coming out of the blue sky that you don't see in the form of this infrared greenhouse radiation, and that also raises the temperature of the ground. Okay, once it gets down to the lower atmosphere, some of it's reflected by clouds, ice, you know, mirrors, whatever, car roofs, the whole things, whatever's down there, and some of it is absorbed by the ground, heats the ground to a temperature that's called the radiative equilibrium temperature. And my model, the theory of the model, is this equation called the Stefan Boltzmann equation there, sigma t to the fourth. So in other words, the temperature of the ground is related to the amount of sunlight and infrared radiation going into the ground by this factor of temperature the fourth. So the, the temperature is the fourth root of this energy absorption with some other constant factors thrown in. And there's a, this is the pictograph version of the climate model. You know, sunlight reflected, sunlight absorbed, infrared, greenhouse effect. You got greenhouse gases down there on the lower right increasing. And up on the top, not my favorite, which are the volcanoes putting this haze up there. And that actually is my current research specialty, is measuring the amount of volcanic stuff in the stratosphere. So, of course, the reality is a lot more complex. There's the famous Keel and Tremor diagram, 1997, updated a few years ago. You know, what's absorbed, what's radiated, what goes into evaporating ocean water, making water vapor, what makes cloud, etc. And then there's even stuff at the surface of the Earth, like ocean currents. This heat gets absorbed in one place, and then it's moved up to the Spitsbergen from the Azores or it's brought down a kilometer deep into the Pacific Ocean, moves all this energy around. So anyway, it's much more complex, and you have all these feedbacks, which the, the paid modelers, the ones with the supercomputer, try to individually approach and calculate from basic principles. My take is, well, what's nature tell us, what's nature screaming at us that these feedbacks are? And it's a number I'll call K, after my first initial. Okay, so the actual temperature change is this radiative equilibrium temperature of the sunlight reaching the lower atmosphere plus the greenhouse radiation times some factor K, which is the net effect of all the feedbacks. So if K is greater than one, the feedbacks amplify the temperature changes. If it's less than one, it suppresses the temperature changes. If it's negative, it actually goes counter. You know, it cools when it should be warming. And if it's one, it's exactly the radiative equilibrium temperature. So, example, say sunlight or something or greenhouse gases warms the surface of the Earth one degree. Well, that increases the theoretical water contact making lots of assumptions by 4% if you assume constant relative humidity and a few other things. That will raise the temperature because water is also greenhouse gas. Matter of fact, there's 30 times as much of it as CO2 on average. So it's a much more important greenhouse gas than CO2. Well, if you raise that by 4%, you get that much more greenhouse radiation, heats up the planet another degree. So in other words, you have a K factor of 2. It doubles the warmth. However, water has a nasty habit once in the atmosphere. There's a thing called the hydrologic, hydrologic cycle. It's got to come back to the ground as rain or snow, which means it makes clouds. So if you have more water vapor, it's going to make more clouds. So if there's 4% more water vapor, say there's 4% more clouds, guess what? 
It reflects enough sunlight to completely negate that effect, brings it down a degree, and you're back where you started with a net K factor of one. Okay, that is a somewhat hypothetical, approximate example of these K factors and, and feedback mechanisms. The reality, well, I shouldn't say the reality, the model, that there was a computer company whose uh, motto was not just data, reality. So data is reality, models aren't. They're a measure of our understanding of reality. And that's not always very impressive. But anyway, Alan Robach, who's got a great sense of humor, did put this flow diagram in. And this is all parameterizing these models of equations and arrows and circles and so on on the back of each one. Okay, so the models, nobody, the big ones, nobody really has a full grasp of. So to the, the modelers at NCAR, National Center for Atmospheric Research, or anywhere else, you have people putting components in. Somebody does the cloud, someone else, and they may have this half a billion dollar experiment flying airplanes across the equator, measuring the clouds, measuring what's ice, what isn't, how much absorption of infrared, da 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 da, how long they last, and so on. So some models are like the elephant, the classic elephant, and the volcanoes, clouds, and so on. And the guy pulling the tail, he's the methane expert. Meanwhile, the others are simply a black box. You know, you go to the computer, you submit a deck of cards, although I think they probably use consoles now. However, they submit a deck of cards, they plug in their input parameters, which could be a solar variable or two billion parts per million of CO2 or whatever, and out comes the other side of the output. And I think for most users, they are really black boxes. So, what are the big forcings at the top of the atmosphere or in the high atmosphere? One is solar variation. That's that one up on the uh, upper left. Notice it's not very much. While this is based on the visible light solar output, you know, in other words, the intensity of the solar sunlight hitting your face and making you feel warm, really not much. And actually, during this period I'm looking at, it's negligible. So I will negligate it. In other words, ignore it. Okay, total greenhouse gases down there at the bottom, clipped off by the console here, increasing. And the time period here is 1979 to 2014, which is the period of satellite record, satellite temperatures. So greenhouse gases have increased. The total scale is plus or minus two watts. So the greenhouse gases have increased roughly one watt, or one and a half watts per square meter. And then over on the upper right are the volcanoes, and that's actually data I produced from volcano observations. And you can see, although the, the shape of the curve is very different than greenhouse gases, the magnitude, the amount of reds or reds and blues are very similar. So it's roughly two watts or so of amplitude. And then the lower right corner is the combination, all three added together. And still the changes are not very great. It's about a two watt per square meter. Or it, I scale it in terms of degrees centigrade or Kelvin, you know, if you're a physicist. So plus or minus, Oh, roughly the whole scale is plus or minus 0.4, which is 0.8. So you can see maybe a bit less than a half a degree total amplitude of the forcing in terms of irradiated equilibrium temperature. Sources, okay, again, just to show you, I didn't pull these numbers out of my hat. These are the references. And again, my specialty is the volcanic, and that's where that stuff is published. And so, Here's the models, the, the CMIP, five models from the IPCC, and it's what in the biz we call a linguine diagram, or some may Americans call it spaghetti diagrams. So you get all these wiggles, and hidden in there is the actual data. But I'll go to a cleaner version of it, which is the mean zone. So the red line is the average of these hundred models. The little dots down on the bottom are balloon and satellite data sets all averaged together. And what does it say about the models? Well, to quote and paraphrase Dr. Feynman, it says they are wrong. They are not catching the proper trend in temperature. They actually, the volcanic dips are showing up quite nicely. 
but the overall trend is much greater than what you see in the observed data. So this is a problem. And it reminds me of a, a quote, this came from Carl Sagan's Cosmos series, the original Cosmos, and he actually had a very beautiful episode about the life and times and the science of Johannes Kepler, who I consider the greatest scientist. He, he invented, anyway, modern science, but I don't want to get too much off into the philosophy and history of science, but just wonderful guy who had a really tough time. So, when Johannes Kepler found that his long cherished beliefs, I'm going to see if I can do my saying it. Okay, long cherished beliefs did not agree with the most precise observations. He accepted the uncomfortable facts. Now, keep in mind, Kepler went into this looking for perfect solids, tetrahedra, and spheres, and everything, and trying to fit the planetary orbits in it, because he knew there was some perfect mathematical harmony to it because he felt God was a mathematician and designed the universe to perfect rules or to paraphrase the ship's captain from the movie The King Mutiny you know, with Humphrey Bogart that the universe was designed by geniuses to be run by idiots. So that was sort of Kepler's vision of the universe, you know. It was perfectly designed. And his role was to find, well, what is the design? What is the mathematics of it? What is, you know, quantify this perfection. So he was looking for all sorts of things. Anyway, he wasn't finding it until one day he stumbled upon some basic laws. So he preferred the hard truth to his dearest delusions. That is the heart of science. So in other words, he rejected his previous hypotheses and finally was able to enlighten himself to the reality and the truth of it. So, what is the uncomfortable fact here? Again, the models are wrong. They overdo the CO2 warning. And IPCC modelers seem to have a hard time accepting it because they keep producing the same models and the same error each time they put out a report. You know, it seems to me, if your models are wrong and demonstrably wrong, don't call the people who produce the data that show the wrong deniers. Go through and find what is wrong with your model and correct it. So I guess I'll attempt to correct it for it. So down at the bottom is what I call my simple carbovolcanic model. It is CO2 in watts per square meter, volcanism, watts per square meter, adjusted to a temperature by Stefan Boltzmann to a radiative equilibrium temperature. That's that great line. However, that still overestimates the changes and the trend and the volcanic dips. You know, it still doesn't do a fit. But if I go through and do a perfectly empirical feedback factor 0.7, it's a beautiful fit. So my model has volcanic forcing, CO2 forcing, and a feedback factor 0.7. That's three, count them, three parameters. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> or 2.9 plus or minus 0.5. Yeah. Or it's also been called fudge factors. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But hey, it, it makes the it makes the model fit the observations which then allows me to make a projection, which is the new word for a prediction, to avoid calling it a prediction. So the K.7 fits the most precise observations, you know, as in the Carl Sagan sense here. It agrees with the experiment in the Feynman sense, and it projects less than a quarter of the warning of the IPCC model consensus. Few tenths of a degree. I put in 0.3, but you know, that's, there's an uncertainty there. By 2100 IPCC, you're up to about 2 degrees Celsius. In other words, 0.3 degrees warming by 2100, I would challenge anybody if I were to somehow magically change the temperature outside on the street by 0.3 degrees, you go outside and tell me if that's going to change your lifestyle. Is it going to change agricultural productivity? Is it going to change heating bills? Is it going to change anything for life on Earth? 
You know, matter of fact, you could hardly even measure. I, I have a weather station. I could not measure 0.3 degrees change. It's not within the technology of weather station measurements. So in other words, global warming is not a crisis, and it will not be. So it is a false dilemma. We don't have to choose between saving the earth or hurting the poor or not hurting the poor because from this problem, there's no need to save the earth. There's not a crisis, there's not a problem. Okay, thank you. Holy. You have some questions for uh, Dr. Kingston? This one. You've shown climate models running a scenario from which there are major worldwide CO2 restrictions. Mm -hmm. If you use the unrestricted IPCC model, which is RCP 8.5, which is twice the greenhouse gas warming area, they're predicting if you don't control greenhouse gas, the business is usually the regions of warming. Yeah. I'm not sure it's a really serious scenario. Yeah. And implicitly, the amount that's in my model is seen as it's calibrated with observations over the past 30 years, is the trend of the CO2 over the past 30, 40 years, which actually is pretty linear, very little hint of any exponential growth, pretty linear, reaching about 500 by the year 2100 which means we're already halfway to that doubling. So any warming you can discern to date is half of this apocalyptic value you're going to get ultimately. Yeah, so in other words, and I tell you, we can have real fights in there if we're even detecting it. You know, is, is detection there? I can remember. So, well, as you showed, it just seems to make tremendous sense to me. I'm not a scientist. I'm really a very good scientist, but I'm not a scientist. So I sit here wondering how would a Kevin Trinder or a Michael Moran or any of the others who are more alarmist about the warning, uh, who think that, that uh, you know, equal every day, that, that uh, you know, ECS is, is much higher than what you're saying. You think that K is, is above one. How would they respond to this? Um, I don't want to mention names, but I know how some of these people have already responded to it. And they pull authoritative science on it. That their models are much better than this, and their models say it's going to warm much more. But what makes the models better? I mean, the model's output doesn't matter. Well, one. So what is it that makes them better? This model cost me about three hours on Excel. Okay. Their models have cost, I'll be pushing $100 billion over 30 years of funding. Yeah. So that makes them better. <laughs> you know, I mean, I guess it's the concept of perceived value. You know, you put a dress in the store and you price it at a thousand bucks, then it's more valuable than a dress at Kohl's that goes for 19. Any other questions here, Dr. King? All right, thank you.